Hello, hello, everyone. We are here. We're ready to discover some things. We got our energy drinks ready. Hello, everyone. Rogue Energy, PDS Energy, and check out. <laughs> you need to just pepper that in more often. <laughs> What's up, Twigs? How you doing tonight? Hey, Twigsley. Feels like it's been forever since I talked to you. It's been so long. It's low. My mic is low, Zach. Yeah, I turned it up. I saw that. My mic's too low. It is really low, though. And that's all the way up. Check, 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 check. Yeah, it's very low. That check was, like, in the green. Very low. And I was right up in it. Yeah. Can I turn my gain up? That was better. I mean, it depends on if I you mean, want I'm to. Not gonna, I'm not going to talk like that. I'm going to talk like this. How's, Hello, how's this it sound? the way I'm going to normally talk. It shows the levels are fine, but I turned your gain all the way up. We'll see if it works. Says that's better. That's better. So something that I feel like we need to keep leaning into is the question of the episode. And I like that. I read a uh, an interesting Reddit thread about things that you should eat for breakfast even though it's not a breakfast food mm. what do you think should be a breakfast food that isn't pizza pizza no, yeah that's a good uh, one uh hmm because i saw someone say on this thread and it did i mean breakfast is a scam it's a social construct and they made up what was supposed to be breakfast foods and most of it is sugar it's like that's that's my thing is i love breakfast <laughs> foods but i love it for dinner i love it or lunch but just not at breakfast time i'm never hungry in the morning like that i'm not very hungry most of the time in the mornings either every once in a while though but no in that thread someone said that their favorite thing is if they could find a diner who will make them a cheeseburger for breakfast and so i was just thinking about what it would be like to have a burger for breakfast. I mean, to me, I don't think there's rules. Like, I don't care. I used to get mad when I found out places didn't serve their regular menu all day long. Like, when I go to Chick-fil-A, at breakfast time, I'm buying the Nuggies. Do they have Nuggies for breakfast? Yeah, because that's what they put inside their little mini biscuits or whatever. Oh. So you can buy the nuggets by themselves. So you're like, I just get rid of those biscuits? Yeah, get rid of them biscuits. Give me those nuggies and give me that barbecue sauce or the Polynesian sauce or whatever. That's just my thing. That sucks, Kelnack. Well, hopefully this will distract you. What is not a breakfast food but should be? And Twigs, we still need your answer. I'm trying to think something that would be like... The thing is, I never really eat breakfast, so it's kind of a hard thing for me to answer. Soups. There should be more soups for breakfast. There should be more breakfast soups. Especially wintertime. Be nice. I can go for breakfast soups. Right? That I sounds mean, it's pretty a good. good. Cozy thing. You know, get your get your insides warm just like a coffee does. A nice breakfast soup with your coffee. I don't know, that kinda of sounds a little bit weird. Breakfast tacos oh, sounds yeah. awesome. No, breakfast tacos done. But I'm talking regular tacos, not like I hate like the really bad like breakfast tacos from like Burger King and like Oh, I'm not getting I, I, no, they're no, no, gross. No. Yeah, they're no, no, gross. No. These places that have breakfast burritos are so bad. Like now when my mom makes them, you know, you know, chopped up eggs with some chorizo or something like that that's different no i could go I for could that any honestly i day. could go for normal tacos that does make me think that i but would normal like tacos. normal tacos for breakfast because if you're talking about like eggs and chorizo that's something that i've eaten my whole life yeah no that's <laughs> that's a that's a classic and then also the uh the florida special down here is you take your breakfast biscuit, you know, so like bacon, egg, and cheese, or whatever meat, you know, whatever, but you put it on Cuban bread. That's the that's the thing down here, the breakfast specialty. Breakfast Cuban. I, I do like those. I do like breakfast Cubans. They're nice. Ooh, burrito bowl? 
That sounds pretty good too. The thing is, I think I would like some spicy stuff for breakfast. That would be good. I I was thinking kimchi because it's like you know, but it's kind of too kimchi. On the head you're we... really committing. You're really <laughs> committing to the the kimchi life very early. I mean, everybody is used to drinking coffee and then just blowing the bathroom up, right? Just eat kimchi and then you're really gonna blow the bathroom up. Just like some some you people start are used the day, to that. You start no, the day with, with just the best bowel movement ever. <laughs> no, but kimchi, it's it's not just a, a one-time event. It's a lifestyle. And if you do it first thing in the morning, you're committing to that lifestyle. <laughs> Sometimes there is a little bit of a burn that lingers. <laughs> well, there's that. I hope everybody wanted to know that about us. I'm sure you didn't, but there's that. Now you do. Now you know whether you want to or not. Okay, we're going to start recording this so we can get going. <laughs> you always learn something on the podcast discovery show. Most of the time you don't want to know it, but that's okay. We're all friends here. Sorry, I'm doing my weekly thing where I have to tweak the size of your video so it doesn't drive me insane the whole time. But Leah's thing's not in frame. i got to try to move it so it's in frame. No, I didn't mess with that. That it just auto did. Maybe that's why it looked like it was yeah, out of frame before. Of the... Ah, it's in frame now. I will say, I think it's hilarious. And I swear she got it from Grandma Twigs. She wrote at the bottom, artwork by Leah Griffin. And then she signed it <laughs> with her initials. <laughs> you can't see it. It's all blurry. She here, watermarked it. So don't even she... think about stealing it, whoever you <laughs> exactly. are. Don't. <laughs> exactly. Don't. <laughs> I just took her this thing because she had made me the Halloween one. I'm like, hey, if you don't have anything to do, make me a new sign because it's still Halloween and I can't use it. She's like, ah, okay. And I thought she wasn't going to do it. <laughs> and then she brought it into me. <laughs> and it looks cool. That one does look really cool. It looks cooler close up. You can't see it good on the video. Anyway. Yeah, it is harder to tell. And once it's lit up, it's honestly a little harder to tell all the details going on. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we are recording. Everything looks good. All right, we're doing PDS first like normal, correct? Yes. That's the plan at least. I do not have any like information about the show or the guy, if you have that. I do. I literally just And I kind of want to I, I want to I want to touch on that diet cuz I'm curious about it and there's actually it's like a mini discovery. Yeah, no, we definitely can. While learning about it, because you wrote a book about it. Supposedly, it's a best-selling book, uh, best-selling author of it's a cookbook for the Banting Diet. Hmm. Yeah. But I found a Wikipedia about the guy that made the diet, and it's fascinating. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the Podcast Discovery Show, the podcast that's about other podcasts, where every single week we have a book club style discussion about a podcast that we recommended last week. At the end of this episode, we're going to recommend a brand new show. We're going to talk about that one next week. I'm Kirk. And I am Zach. And this week and we're talking about Kirk's recommendation from last week, The Fantastic History of Food. And we actually had a cool way that we found out about this show. Yeah, so Podcorn did not pay us to say this, but we, uh, we've we used Podcorn a few times to get advertisers on our show and also to advertise on other people's shows. And one of the people that reached out to us to be an advertiser was this podcast. And we picked people that we really thought was kind of like in our ethos, in our vein of like, shows that we would recommend and when i read what it was about i'm like there's no way that we probably can't talk about this one because it's we love history we love food put those two together you got some really great stuff yeah we've I talked mean, about a lot of this it's style like show. lore but about food you know it's like mm -hmm. history of like crazy stories but related to food um and the two episodes that i recommended were episode 19 Tomatoes were blamed for witchcraft and werewolves in episode 15, Three Tales of Cheese. 
uh, what was the subtitle there? From Egyptian mummies to Uruguayan cannonballs. Uh, so much. There's just so much yeah. to that one specifically. I loved the cheese one. I'm not gonna. It, lie. it was yeah. No, the it, but mainly just because it was ridiculous. Some of the <laughs> things that were happening in it. But um, yeah. Uh, the ho- the the show is hosted by Nick Charlie Key. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure he's in South Africa. If I'm if I'm mistaken, I'm sorry. All the social media and stuff points to South Africa. Um, but he's also an author of a book, a best-selling book called The Bantwagon Cookbook. First of all, I love the play on words like bandwagon, but bantwagon. Uh, but I, what made me think of what made me like, well, what's a bant cookbook? What does that mean? And uh, I did a little bit of research, and it kind of made me have like a mini discovery about what a banting diet is. And essentially, I would say our equivalent for us to wrap our minds around it here in the U.S. at least would be it's very similar to a keto diet. But it was invented by this guy named William Banting. Uh, He was a notable English undertaker, and he was formerly obese. But he's known he's well known for being the first to popularize a weight loss diet based on limiting intake of carbohydrates, especially those of starchy or sugary nature. He undertook his dietary changes at the suggestion of a physician, Dr. William Harvey, who in turn had learned of this diet type of diet, but in the context of diabetes management. So basically, he's the one that popularized uh, a low carb diet. Hmm. And so that's why they call it the banting diet in other places uh, here we call it the keto diet uh but well yeah there was i feel similar. like there was like five other yeah, I mean, trend what, diets what right the before south that. beach diet yeah south point. beach diet um, i feel like most diets in general paleo is very similar to it it's you know there's a lot of them but anyway uh nick charlie key he's a cool guy this is a fairly new ep- new show i think he's like a few maybe 20 something episodes in so, but it's a it's a very well written show. What I really like about it is, um, like I said, it's similar to Lore, where you can tell that the 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 show has been written and uh, very well researched. But that means that you can get a transcript of the show, and I love that. It makes things a lot easier. If you miss something, or there's something you want to reference on his website, he's got a really nice website for the show as well. Um, He's got all the links for all the sources and stuff. And I, I, I just love when someone is that intentional to put the effort into sharing all the links and stuff like that for a uh, a show that they spent so much time researching. Yeah, you can tell that he has put in the time to understand these things, but then he also has a knack for storytelling. Uh, it, it is something where throughout it you're learning sometimes ridiculous things we will definitely get to some of the (laughs) actually it's ridiculous in both of these like full-on ridiculous the things that he's talking about but both of them are heavily researched there's a lot of instances that he references but then it's fun to listen to well fun and terrifying honestly that's the thing is the cheese one i feel like is fun the Mm -hmm. tomato one is more terrifying Mm -hmm. than that I listened to another episode and I wanted to bring it up, but it was two episodes back to back. And I didn't, I didn't want to talk too much about that one topic. It was about coffee. And I think we mentioned it actually maybe a little bit last week, how like coffee at one point was, it it was illegal longer in some countries than alcohol. Hmm. Uh, And to the point where people were being killed if they were seen drinking coffee, (laughs) it's just crazy and it's dark, but it's also just like history's crazy and I don't know. It, it was fascinating. But so let's jump into the episode specifically about tomatoes first. Yeah, and this is definitely one of the – okay, because we've talked about it a couple times on the on the show where it's all nice and it's all fun and games to be like, oh, I'd love to go back to different times in history and experience the history – and then you read about the history and it's usually nightmare fuel. And this is definitely one of those times because essentially tomatoes developed 
a reputation during the era of like the Salem witch trials. And apparently what I didn't realize is this was a huge thing, not exclusive to any one region, but just pervasive across the world. It sounds like the Western world, at least. Yeah. I thought that it was bad here, you know, in Salem, Massachusetts and, you know, kind of more unique to here in the United States, but apparently it was real bad other places as well. What, what did they say? Like 500,000 people. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. There's they just, they said across Europe and the West, essentially, there's a chance that 500,000 people were killed during the Salem witch trials. So many people guys. Yeah. And it's crazy. Cause it was all most of the time made up and looking no, right all the time. There was no witches. Well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I'm saying like yeah. half the time it was like not even for a reason. It was yeah. like, I don't like my neighbor, so I'm going to say she's a witch. And literally she'll be killed. Uh, it, it was just – it's it's mind-boggling when you look into the whole like witch scare or whatever it's called, uh, whether here or abroad. That whole thing is just ridiculous. Um, yeah, it was – and so that's kind of the backdrop on why tomatoes developed this weird thing. And and yeah, they are very close to the nightshade family. My brother insists that he uh, has a light nightshade allergy that causes him to feel sleepy when he eats tomato products. Yeah, I remember Josh saying he had a little bit of a uh, allergy to tomato products. I think it's just because he gets tired when he eats pizza. And so he says that's <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> For some reason, I get tired when I eat pizza or spaghetti, so I must have it's, an allergy it's the to allergy tomatoes. to nightshades. <laughs> um, but the thing that was crazy to me is not only was it like involved with witches or whatever, but somehow it got morphed to tomatoes will turn you into a werewolf. Yeah, and all of it is kind of based off a tomato is closely related to other things. And obviously this is like pre-science heavy theocracy and like weird times. So there was no voice of reason on, Hey, that's not actually the plant you think it is. But this all started because I think he said the Pope literally said that the witch's concoction that she makes is some kind of plant. And the plant kind of looked like a tomato plant and that's it. That's literally it. But then tomatoes became this thing where people saw tomatoes in your garden. They're like, oh, oh, no, she's got the devil fruit. She's going to be a witch. <laughs> and so, yeah, but they also mentioned how like the plant, the tomato plant looks very similar to nightshade plant, which is poisonous. And the, you know, the fruit for like cherry tomatoes looks very similar to a mandrake, which is also poisonous. So early uneducated people, they obviously, you know, were very skeptical of anything tomatoey because they thought there might be poison as well. That actually makes a little bit more that sense. That does make more witch, sense than the witch, the witch, than the witch angle of all that. of this. Yes. Yeah. Being <laughs> well, afraid of poison crazy. is a good idea. Something that stood out to me, just talking about this absurdity of the witch scare, which now we're going to go to a different absurd thing, which was the Spanish Inquisition. But – there was something that kind of clashed with these together, which was <laughs> the Spanish Inquisition we've talked about recently, actually. And it was just ridiculous, crazy. Oh, it's just – it's one of the – it's very similar to the, to the witch thing. It's just – it's crazy. But during the Spanish Inquisition, to believe that witches existed was to be a heretic and then you could be killed. So – you couldn't even accuse someone of being a witch because that means you believe in witches and then you would be killed. So Spain ended up being one of the safest places to eat tomatoes. Uh, I mean, <laughs> what what can you do? They're, they're playing that next level game where you can't call anybody a witch because then, you, then you're saying there are witches and that's, uh, that's illegal. It's, it's We're going to throw crazy. you in the ocean. And then they talk about the... Uh, I need to look that up real quick. That that tom that giant tomato fight that they have every year in in Spain. Yep. Spain has some amazing, just crazy customs. Uh, some of them a lot of people don't like, but some of them are just like 
Oh no, they know how to party. It's just crazy. They do know how to party. I've been to Spain and I would love to go back as an adult because I went as a kid and I saw everybody having such a great time and I was like, this is awesome. I wish and I could I drink. Now I want to go back as an adult now that I can drink. <laughs> yeah, I was about, yes. I was like, you could say it. It's okay. That's why I'd want to go there too. Tapas and Spanish wine. Let's go. La Tomatina. It was it was canceled this year because of COVID, guys. Well, I mean, <laughs> just another casualty of the of the pandemic. It's, but uh, it's La Tomatina is a festival that is held in Valencia, town of Buñol, in the east of Spain in which participants throw tomatoes and get involved in a tomato fight purely for entertainment purposes. <laughs> and it's like, if you haven't ever seen a video of this, you should look one up because tomato fight is the real definition. Like, it's honestly surreal, the amount of tomato that's just everywhere after this thing. Yeah, no, it's it's crazy. Uh, I, I do want to go to the running the bulls and watch people just be real stupid. I also want to go to this. No, I would Spain. participate in La Tomatina. I would, I would participate in this. I would never participate in the running of no, the bulls. Definitely. I want not. to see people do stupid stuff and hopefully not get killed. Actually, we we've, we've done research and very few people get killed, but people get hurt all the time. People get hurt uh, every time, but they <laughs> rarely die. Uh, but yeah, uh, we've talked about doing a trip to Spain, a PDS spain trip we've got oh, and it'll it. happen it'll happen post pandemic yeah i mean definitely now at least now we have a reason other than not having enough money i know it makes <laughs> me feel better about it it does I can't make me go. feel better we're like we can't go on vacation not because we don't have enough money but because, because of we can't because we're being <laughs> safe <laughs> now when covid's over it's gonna be because i don't have yeah enough then it's money. back to we don't have money again and we don't need to think about that time Nope, we don't need to think about that. Uh, but apparently the reason that tomatoes were, I guess, class or people thought of them as something that could make you turn into a werewolf is because the translation was like wolf peach. <laughs> I wish that it was still called a wolf peach. Tomato is a stupid <laughs> word. Wolf peach is a great word. It sounds awesome. <laughs> Yeah, as soon as you heard it, I was like, well, that's dumb. They shouldn't have changed the name ever from that. How do you change? Wolf, wolf peach sauce. How, how do you change the name of anything, even if it wasn't a tomato? If it's called a wolf peach, it is permanently a wolf peach. It's not hard. Just leave it. Leave it there. So good. So freaking good. Um, and, and then there was a... It go did ahead. go into... One of my favorite parts was when they all thought that it was going to kill them. So there was multiple, like the guy, they called it a suicide attempt where a guy sat down with like a, a bucket of tomatoes and people were playing like a funeral march for him. And everybody's just like watching like, oh, he's going to die. And he just ate a ridiculous amount of tomatoes and then went home. <laughs> it's like the olden days were uh, different. They were, uh, they were very different. And then there was also uh, Cook tried to uh, poison George Washington with, uh, with tomatoes. Yes. Yes, he did. And, I mean, surprisingly, that did not kill George Washington. George Washington didn't die, guys. He is immune he to wolf dinner. peaches. <laughs> um, so that was the episode about tomatoes. Was there anything else you had on the episode about tomatoes? I don't think so. No, there's, uh, I mean, I, I can ask you, do you like tomatoes? Some people, I feel like I that's, love tomatoes. That's kind of like a hot I, take for some people. Some people don't really like them. I love them so much. It is one of those things. It's like some people do not like them like at all they're like i love ketchup but i hate tomatoes um i mean i'll say this ketchup don't like tomatoes. v8 i will say that i do not like v8 um it tastes like salty it tastes like i'm drinking the sauce out of a can of like spaghettios and i just it does nothing for me and it also like gives it me heartburn right. immediately like before i actually <laughs> drink it i think just when i see it i get heartburn um <laughs> but i can also take or leave tomatoes when they're not in season you know, because I feel like a lot of times when you get like a hamburger at like a fast food place, it's like a white tomato. It's like, yeah, that tastes like wet nothing, so I'll pass. I have to have a tomato on a lot of different things. Um, PB&J. Yes, that's one of them. Uh, I love tomatoes. Hot dog. Uh, I, <laughs> Ice cream cone. I, I have chopped tomatoes and put them in my hot dog because a hot dog's a sandwich, and I feel like 
all sandwiches. Do we need to get into this right now? Okay, tacos or all are sandwiches sam- need to have tomatoes. Is uh, what here's I'm the thing. To say. I feel like okay, we can let's go here. Sandwich debate. We're going there. Hot dog okay. is a sandwich. This hot is dog a, is a sandwich. That, and I really don't have too much of a horse in this fight, but that means that tacos are sandwiches. Exactly. And that also Thank means you. that pop tarts are sandwiches. I don't know about that no. one. <laughs> Bread outside of filling. <laughs> Ice cream sandwiches, same thing. I mean, I'm fine with saying a pop tart's a sandwich. I mean, it's a gross are sandwich. You? <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, like, uh, it, it's essentially like I don't really care. I'm just saying, as soon as we open up that burrito's a sandwich. Like, as soon as you start making it so everything's a sandwich, yeah, you can just say everything's a sandwich. But no, I mean, I think a burrito's more like a wrap. You know, how or, is a wrap you know, not a sandwich? American wrap it's is bread uh, on top of toppings. Uh, but yeah, uh, hot dogs are sandwiches. And now, the food czar of the Gravity Beard interns. Paul Chomo, the host of Varmint's podcast, has now officially come out and said that hot dogs are sandwiches. After like four years of pressure, he's finally caved and said that hot dogs are sandwiches. I also think that he could be doing this to just troll people the other way. Because then he will have trolled every single person in Gravity Beers interns. (laughs) I mean, he definitely trolled me because I've been telling him all along a hot dog is a sandwich. But anyway, I have put tomatoes on my uh, hot dogs because it's great. Yeah, no, it's and the Chicago dog has definitely leaned into putting the lots of veggies on there. So mm-hmm. that's not that crazy. But yeah, then we get to cheese. And the crazy things that happened with cheese. Uh first of all, I was highly disturbed by the origination of cheese by the Right? F- uh, yeah, not good. Um, I would not have guessed that. So I don't know what I would have guessed, but that wasn't not, it. Not that. <laughs> not that. Like, I would have guessed somebody left out milk too long. Or, like, I, that's they, what were, I thought. they were taking milk to, like, deliver it to somebody. But, and I mean, it kind of was that. So, people used to have dairy and they didn't have cups. So, what did they carry it in? They carried it in, like, stomachs Animal of stomachs. animals. And without knowing it, by pure accident, they carried dairy in the stomach of an animal. And the enzymes to make cheese was discovered there because they were it's wandering around. Renant. Yeah, rennant. They were wandering around one day with their stomach tied just to their sloshing belt. Sloshing it around. Yeah, just sloshing <laughs> on their adventures. And then they get there and they're like, this milk is chunky now. I'm still going to eat it though. <laughs> and then there was cheese. Then cheese was born. And, and there was like, and don't get me wrong, this is a a staple food for everywhere i think at this point let me ask you zach how much do you love cheese i don't love cheese i don't zach love cheese is an animal in the fact that he doesn't love cheese i am it fine. kind of sa- i will say i know you enough to know that you're not actually a picky eater but this episode makes it sound like you're a picky eater because you're like i'm not crazy about tomatoes I don't like cheese that much. No, you know and here's what I mean? the thing. If it's a fresh <laughs> tomato, I will eat it every time. And like on a sandwich. if it's... I used to eat tomatoes like apples when I was a kid. I would literally just pull them out of the fridge and eat the whole thing. Like the whole thing. I still do it every now and then, but now I put a little salt. Sometimes and mayonnaise. I, I don't even know it's, if it's worth <laughs> going into uh, my cheese stuff. Everyone I've talked to about it doesn't get it. I'm fine with cheese as part of a thing. You will never find me eating just like cheese sticks or just cubes of cheese i ate cheese sticks tonight yeah i don't mm, <laughs> won't happen but as part of like a thing i never like i never fight back on it but no i'm not like a, a person who has to just like stuff myself with cheese ever but i like pizza you know i'm a I complicated person dude you give me a charcuterie board and i'll be so happy i love cheese and i love no, and i don't mind charcuterie board things. As bad because you can throw like pickles. It's like a mini sandwich. Pickles, meat, Talk about cheese. Spain again. I want to go to Spain so bad because the thing that I remember is going to all these bars as a kid with my parents and just being blown away by how good the cheese and meat was. And you get it for freaking free everywhere you go because they have tapas. And tapa bar in Spain is you buy a drink, you get a free appetizer. 
that's what it is. It's not. I hate when I see people like I'm gonna go to the tapas bar and then get appetizer for like fifteen bucks each, and it's like this tiny little thing. It makes me so triggered. No, I'm they like, took a. I've been to a tapas marketing. bar. <laughs> I've been genius. to a tapas bar. The, the only thing you pay for is drinks. Everything else is free. <laughs> yeah, it's it's genius marketing on their part. They're like, we're gonna let's give them less food and charge them more and call it tapas. Let's give them a lunchable, and then charge them freaking 15 bucks if for someone it. charged me 15 dollars for a lunchable <laughs> they're getting punched in the head uh no but uh, basically uh, i don't know i have a complicated relationship with cheeses but in like a charcuterie setting it's usually fine because it's not like i'm just gonna eat a piece of cheese it's gonna be like a that's the real version of a of a lunchable is uh charcuterie but yeah so basically they discovered the the way <laughs> the weird way to make cheese which is wandering around and after that it began to evolve in different ways um so i you said it was i think it was the romans who were yes. yeah 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 because mm -hmm. it was italian it was like romano mm -hmm, yeah. and uh parmesan really hard cheeses that literally you have to like crack open with like a hammer and a chisel and they would carry those around with their warriors because it would maintain its structure and they could eat it while they're traveling and things like that. I don't know why, but for some reason it reminded me of like Lord of the Rings and the litmus bread. <laughs> yeah. No, it's basically the same concept. It's like, I, just hang on to it. Uh, but also I wanted some hard cheese when I, when I heard about it, I want some hard cheese now, but then they talked about literally like the oldest cheese that was ever discovered. And it was 3,000 years old. And they literally found it, like, in an Egyptian tomb. Uh, and luckily, no one tried to eat it, because apparently when they actually analyzed it, it had, like, a an ancient bacteria that was very, uh, very, very bad and could kill you very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, maybe don't eat random stuff out of tombs. I mean, it seems like that's a that's an easy easy rule to set it's not something most of us are ever going to uh run into then he actually talks about something that i think you brought as a discovery on todd's once right i don't think i ever ended up discussing it i think we talked about it like on a gaming stream as one of the discoveries i was going to bring oh but I didn't end maybe up i just saw it. the link somewhere you posted the link somewhere yes so this one, that's why I, I mentioned it last week, I believe, that this was one of my discoveries that I was going to bring, but I haven't brought it yet. And it was that Andrew Jackson, when he became president, a cheese farmer, um, to help celebrate this new president that he loved and wanted to, you know, and basically say welcome to being president, the thing, uh, this farmer decided to give Andrew Jackson a giant wheel of cheese. It, it took 150 dairy cows being milked for four days to create this wheel of cheese, and it was almost two tons. It was huge. And then it went on uh, a little Northeast tour on its way yeah, to the White House. it went on a tour <laughs> on its way to the White House. You were like, just, well, you look at the size of that cheese. Would you look at the cheese? Yeah, see, it's the biggest news. cheese I've ever seen. Uh, people um, were bored there was no internet <laughs> there was no internet there was no tiktok um, there was no tiktok even uh, if there even if there was tiktok you know that everybody would be taking tiktok videos of the cheese <laughs> for sure um i i wanted to read this one quote it, it it talks about because he didn't eat the cheese for a long time it literally sat in the white house for almost eight years uh and this and then, is by far the most disturbing part of the story. To me. <laughs> hey, it was aging. It was it was getting better. It's it like was a, stinking cheese up is the like White a House. Fine wine, but cheesy. Uh, um, it's like a fine cheese. <laughs> <laughs> fine aged cheese. Anyway, uh, he decided to break out the cheese. He decided to cut the cheese on his his leaving party, basically his farewell uh, dinner that he had. And there's a quote. He said, For hours did a crowd of men, women, boys, and girls hack at the cheese, making large, taking large hunks of it away with him. When they commenced, the cheese weighed 1,400 pounds, and only a small piece was saved for the president's use. 
The air was redolent with cheese. The carpet was slippery with a soft, creamy All of this is so disgusting. And trampled as they went. And nothing else was taken about, talked about in Washington for many days after. Even the scandal about the wife of the president's secretary of war was forgotten in the tumultuous jubilation of the great occasion. The cheese. This all sounds horrifying. (laughs) Can you imagine what it smells like to crack open an eight-year-old 1400 pound well, block of cheese. What do you cheese? think Parmesan is? It's like super old. Oh, and Parmesan's like stanky. Ridiculous. No, but not yeah, like. But it tastes amazing. Yeah, but it's also not 1400 pounds in an enclosed space <laughs> with people just like chewing on it and slipping on the floor with it and just like getting cheese air everywhere. <laughs> it's a cheese slip and slide, yeah, man, just, in the just White House. Place covered with cheese air and just cheese <laughs> grease all over the floor. <laughs> sounds amazing. It sounds it like my. Sounds horrifying. Amazing dream like an amazing dream <laughs> yeah i like how these savages were just like gnawing on a freaking old thing of cheese just like give me a give me a wedge of that <laughs> give me a wedge of that <laughs> um i will say this last story though it was my favorite by far was my favorite yes. of any of these stories it's just it's so great i mean people were killed in it but it's also so great the time that cheese killed people <laughs> yeah i'm sure there's been more uh, there's probably multiple times, but um, it was a story about a, basically a battle. It was between Uruguay and Argentina, correct? It's uh, I think so. And so it was a ship battle in the middle of the ocean, and I don't remember people's names and stuff like that, but they were having a battle. The Uruguayan guy's like, oh, we've got them on the run. Fire. And nothing happened. He's like, why aren't you firing, guys? And his crew's like, we used all the cannonballs. And then he's like, and this is a resourceful guy, man. This is a resourceful dude right here. He's like, use all the cheese. And so they shoved the cheese into the cannons, and they shot them at the Argentine Navy that was trying to retreat. They broke the masts of the other ship. They put holes in the sails of the other ship. There was cheese shrapnel that was freaking going everywhere. It literally killed like three sailors. And, and the Argentine Navy like completely ran away with their tail tucked between their legs because of the, these cheese cannonballs that were fired at them. And it was great. I like to think that he said some awesome like snappy little line. After they run away, you know what I mean? What is that snappy line, Zach? I'm trying to think. Okay, how about like fondue? More like fondant. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't like that one. <laughs> it's so bad. No, it's not. It's, it's so, so good. I mean, I don't have a better one, but it's so bad. <laughs> but yeah, I loved that story. That was probably my favorite story. But it was a great show. It was very well researched. If you go to the, I, I put the links in the in the live show for you know, some of these episodes for the transcripts, they have pictures. Um, Nick does a great job in narrating the show. And I don't know. I I loved the show. I learned a lot and history's crazy and food's awesome. How about this? I just made them a new tagline. How about this? (laughs) Now you're fun doomed. (laughs) No, it's even worse. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> fun oh. don't do that anymore <laughs> come on stop it <laughs> okay fine i'll stop <laughs> no Your it is stupid cheesy it's a, jokes it's God. a great it's a great show yeah you learn a ton it, honestly i've always found the origins of foods completely fascinating i i don't know it's just so important to culture and then there's always some weird origin story that I want to hear about. And this show does exactly that. They dig in and it's, it's a great show and everyone should check it out. I am always fascinated. I actually was talking to my kids about this the other night at dinner. I was like, who ever thought about eating a lot of this food? I forget what we were eating. We were eating something. I'm like, who would have ever thought to eat this? Oh, I was, I was freaking cracking those pecans the other day. I'm like, who would have thought this hard nut that falls out of a tree? If you crack it open, and pull out the middle of it, it tastes good. Like, it's crazy to, to me to think about the first person that yeah. tried no, something. No, and, and some of them, they go farther than A lot than of that. time, there's no history no, for No, like it. coffee. Do you remember when we learned about how coffee was found? Someone, like, found it. One. I think goats were eating it. 
and then pooping out coffee beans. <laughs> There's like seven steps. It's like, mm, okay, somebody's not telling <laughs> what happened in between this. Something <laughs> so happened. Making like something disturbing stew? happened here, or, or and don't lie to me and say it didn't. Goat poop stew. Yeah, and then they got really awake. Yeah, they're like, oh, I feel like, this is great. I feel alive. <laughs> I'm gonna chase that feeling. <laughs> oh man, but no, it's a great show. Uh, you should check it out if you're into food at all or history or both like we are yeah it's really Um, great i have a recommendation that i listened to today i found the show recently but i actually listened to the episode that i want to recommend today a lot of these times a lot of times i'll find a show i'm like this is a great show i love the premise i want to find that perfect episode so it takes me a little bit to kind of like listen through the catalog and find the one that i think that we need to talk about and i found it It's so freaking good. The name of the show is Nice Try. And it's specifically about utopias. Most of the time, failed utopias. And I've always been fascinated by what people think is a utopia. And these people that have tried to make a utopia. um, Like they talk about Disney They talk about like Walt Disney and like the town that celebration or whatever in Orlando. I wanted to talk about that one a little bit, but honestly, I don't get the thing with celebration. Like it's nice. I don't get it either. I I mean, it's it's an idealized place, but I don't, I don't, I don't know. I feel like the the whole thing of like the good old days feeling minus the crappy old days uh, infrastructure. (laughs) I guess you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But, um, I don't really get it. But the episode that I want to recommend is called Biosphere 2. And this this happened, like, I believe in our lifetime, Zach. I think it was, like, in the early 90s. So we were young, but I think it was early 90s. And it was, like, in Arizona, and they made this giant biosphere. I think when they, they added up the cost, it was, like, over $200 million. Wait, is this the documentary with Polly Shore? No, it is not Biodome. <laughs> Uh, but it's very similar it really is uh it's 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 a great story it's crazy there's it, it, oh man it's it's you'll see yeah it's so I'm good. looking forward to it uh so it's nice try biosphere Two: the theater of utopia thank you guys for listening to the podcast discovery show we really appreciate it and remember there's always more to discover okay no, we'll stop I think this we one. Killed it. The reason I say that is because I had to write down any edits. <laughs> oh, no edits that time. Yeah, it makes sense. It was mainly because I had to. Uh, hey, see you, see you, Braven. Thanks for stopping Bye, by, Braven. man. Braven, thank you so much for swinging by. I had a hard time keeping it together when you said something about going to get topless bars and. <laughs> I Spain. know. I couldn't. Oh, that one was almost an edit because I kept saying topless bar. He said, "I've never been to a topless bar." <laughs> <laughs> I almost lost. I was my like, shit. okay, I need to just not look at <laughs> chat right now. I got to keep going. Uh, when I'm talking, I can't look at chat because I'll get distracted. And but by yeah, the way, thanks for I feel bad man. sometimes when we don't reference chat, but when we're recording the podcast, sometimes we can't because it makes my job harder. Yeah, it really depends. Okay, here's when I try not when to do it. When we have a break, it. when we have an right. edit. Then we try to address. But yeah, if we just start randomly talking, the Kirk's gonna have random, like one sentence edits throughout the episode, and it also it's really hard when you stop like mid conversation to get back to where it makes sense when you edit it back together. Yeah, that's the. I feel like that's the art to podcasting is putting the edits together where it doesn't feel like you edited anything. (laughs) Yeah. It's like the opposite of... You two get out of here. We don't ignore you. What? No. We don't, we don't do those things. No, but thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, hanging out, Braven. Twigs, you don't, you don't cap with me. You get that out of here. <laughs> Why is my screen different? Did you fix it and then you didn't go to, like, transition? No, it's because I ended the recording here. I'll start the ne- and actually uh, no, I don't want to start the next one yet. I see. But yeah, no, it changes every time because I have to do a window capture. So, 
But I do think it's better because it's the same. All right, see you, Braven. Have a good night, man. La Tomatina. I think I want to do that more than I want to go to the Running of the Bulls now. Oh, I definitely want to do that more than the Running of the Bulls. No doubt. I just love the parties around the Running of the Bulls. <laughs> just like all these bars having like ridiculously amazing deals and people just all crashing at other people's houses and it's just this camaraderie and stuff like that it's crazy i want to go to spain so bad i want to go to spain as well we will so, so before we buy our bar our, our bar wait cake, i thought our bar was gonna be in spain oh now we're okay <laughs> the best of both worlds it's a topless bar. A topless, a topless bar. bar. Oh, topless, topless. <laughs> Do you know how good that would be? People would go crazy for that. <laughs> We're geniuses. <laughs> topless, topless. Thank you, Braven. Thank you. <laughs> and it, it's just, it's the easiest <laughs> business model of all time. You're like, here's the idea. Topless, topless. And they're like, I get it, genius. Here's our money. Hey, we're in Tampa, dude. We're like, we're in like the. We are in like a, a strip club capital. Aside from like Vegas, probably we have more strip clubs per capita than anywhere else in the U.S. We have one that has a spaceship on top. I've still never been to any strip club ever, but I do want to just go to that spaceship one. Remember we talked about just yeah, renting it out. We talked about it. That's the <laughs> VIP room here. I need actually no. I don't know if I want to put that in our chat. We might get terms of service strike on putting strip club links in here okay but i we I, we okay i want to talk about that one for a second because that one was crazy because we learned that that spaceship was actually like a 70s like mobile home like yeah. it was a thing they made these spaceships it looks almost like similar to like okay a here's air, what we like can do Airstream? i'm not gonna i'm not gonna link the uh the actual club i'm gonna look up a. Uh, you're going to look up those actual... A picture. No, it's going to be a like a, a Google <laughs> image picture of the spaceship. That's on top of the strip club? Yes. <laughs> okay, see? Okay, perfect. This is a Tampa Bay Times article. You see what I mean? Then this isn't like a... This isn't a disturbing article. This is just so everyone can see what we're talking about. This is very I close say, to us as a kid because it's near the bucks stadium and i used to go to bucks games or soccer games like with my family as a little kid like younger than mason and i always was like daddy can we ever go to the spaceship place i had no idea what it was but it had a giant spaceship on top of the building <laughs> it does and it still does but yeah this is that article breakdown of why the spaceship is there and you can see other ones that aren't attached to strip clubs but it's a really cool article. Does this one have the picture of the? Uh, oh yeah, it does. It has the picture of the. Uh, Honestly, we should bring this as a know, as a doesn't. discovery for Todd's next week. But we've done it before. Oh yeah, I think we did. Did we talk about this in Todd's? Yes, it was at. I remember talking about this at Josh's house in particular. But these things look awesome. I want one of these so bad. A strip club? No. But then at the very <laughs> bottom, you can see the VIP room. That's what I was wondering if it still showed the VIP room because it looks. It does look but cool, right? 15 minutes costs between 175 and 200 so like a virtual tour of the inside of the VIP room oh, there's a nice bar in there it looks it there's so many mirrors and stuff it's confusing it's like a, it's like a madhouse yeah they want you to be confused in there <laughs> It looks like a fun house. That's crazy. All right. Okay, everybody. We're going to take a quick break to get everything set up for the next one. The floor is lava. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for watching the stream. Probably two, three minutes. We'll just take a quick bathroom break, mm -hmm. get all of our notes lined up, and then we're back for the other Discovery show. And then immediately after that, it's time for some video games. Game time. It's time for some video games. And I get the sense that people are ready for some Overwatch. And we just need to we need to break it out. Cream. We need to get the group together. We need to try and say mystery heroes three times and summon Bunny Cat. <laughs> um 
but we will be back in just a minute. Thank you so much for checking out the stream. We really appreciate it.
So yeah, you should be able to see uh, what I'm talking about now. Yep. Okay, I see the sign too much. Not enough me. Oh, perfect. And I don't know why that would have changed, but it did. I don't know either. It did. Because, <laughs> yeah, I didn't mess with any of the camera settings. No clue. All right. Let me grab some notes. Okay. I think I have everything already pulled up here. By the way, I looked up times cheese has killed people. And it's always Listeria from raw cheese. So lame. Yeah. It sucks. Because I feel like, dude, dying of like food poisoning or something sounds like the worst. Yeah, it's probably uh, unpleasant. Bunny cat, what is something that is not a breakfast food but should be? All right, let me see. I might. I think have... I changed my mind. I know what should be breakfast food. What? Pickles. Just eating a pickle. Mm -hmm. I need a pickle now. Go get your pickled beets. Eat them on stream. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that to Twig. I do have my pickled beets right here, though. Do you guys? Aunt Annie's pickled beets. This podcast is brought to you by Aunt Annie's pickled beets. Baby whole pickled beets. They're beets and they're pickles. Stick them in your mouth. <laughs> Stick them in your mouth hole. Uh, they're good, though. I, this first time I tried them. I like beets and I love pickles. So I was like, I'm going to try these. And I was not disappointed. I like them. Okay. All right. I guess we're ready. Mm hmm. Oh, you have, you have hit record. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, you can see the timestamp, right? Yep, I can. Welcome to the other Discovery Show, the podcast that's not about podcasts. It's the bonus show from the Podcast Discovery Show, and it's about all the other things we discovered throughout the week. I'm Kirk. And I am Zach. And I discovered something that I think is very exciting. I read, I, I, I bring up space a lot because I find it very exciting in general. I love but space. But NASA is starting the planning of putting a nuclear power plant on the moon. And what? by their planning this, the goal is to have this ready to be put on the moon by 2026. So they are about to start putting out proposals now. They're going to start reaching out to industry experts on building a self-contained nuclear fission reactor. And what they want to do is build it on Earth they want to test it on Earth for about a year to make sure that it's all good. And then it needs to be able to be packed up and launched to the moon. And then a lander would essentially lower this thing and put it onto the moon itself. And here's why this is amazing. This is the first step for one, traveling to somewhere like Mars. Because that's the reason we haven't been able to do it so far is because it takes so much effort for us to get out of the atmosphere that we haven't been able to do that and then also make, I think it's like nine months in a spaceship to get to Mars. Mm. So we haven't been able to have enough stuff to just go straight there with like with people on board. You know, that's why we always send like rovers and things like that because you can just send yeah. it. It takes what it takes and it just gets there eventually. We're going to send it. But this would mean this is also the first step for a moon base like a semi-permanent moon base where you would have a powered situation there where you could set up like a, a second stop. So instead of sending people straight to Mars, you would send people to the moon base where they could resupply, they could do whatever they need to do, and then you go from the moon base to Mars. Yeah, because then you don't have the atmosphere to fight with. 
Right. Hmm. That's what I was thinking of. Okay, so at first, I'm not going to lie. The first thing I thought about was like, is this is like some science fiction movie where we put a nuclear reactor on the moon and then it blows up a portion of the moon. Accidentally blow up the moon. <laughs> and then, you know, that we don't have tides anymore and our the whole world is effed forever. I mean, that would be <laughs> ridiculous. But I then realized the moon's pretty big. It's probably not going to destroy the whole moon. Worst case scenario. No, and I don't think for some that's... reason something went wrong. I don't think it would be the same type of thing because Chernobyl's like the worst possible thing we've seen, like on the planet. You know, like so far the worst like radioactive event we've seen is Chernobyl meltdown, but that didn't like blow up half of Russia. It literally just created like a radiation dead zone that's still there. Like, don't get me wrong, it wouldn't be good. But I don't think it like would blow up the moon. You know, they aren't do they are trying to do something like gigantic enough that it like could a, accidentally like the, like the, the, the moon. The like evil villain that's their thing is they want to blow up. Yeah, the moon. they're not trying to make a Death Star. <laughs> what they're trying to do is just have enough power from this thing to power an outpost. Because then we can start running long term testing on the moon. We can start having that like kind of waypoint to doing other things. And so it just is really interesting to hear that like some of this stuff that and that's no, I that's think, not that far away 2026 no. is not that far away and i feel like the reason i'm so interested in all time is because it's like these things were like science fiction for so long you know like moon bases and going to mars and things like that but now it's not like people thinking like oh science fiction what could maybe be 100 years in the future we're talking about this decade they want to do this we're talking about these types of missions could be planned very, very soon. It's not something of like fiction and science fiction now. It's something that's like just science. It's just yeah. where we're at. And so I just, it's crazy to me and awesome. Yeah, we had a launch the other day and I went and I wanted to watch it from my backyard, but there was too many clouds. I couldn't see it. But we still watch the live stream. I love how they're live streaming it now. Like you mentioned that last week, I believe. But I love how they're live streaming it all the time on Twitch now. Um, well, they live stream it on multiple platforms, but it's it's great. I love it. One thing this article also has is literally a section devoted to is a nuclear reactor safe on the moon? <laughs> and <laughs> nuclear energy has been used in space numerous times before. Um, atomic energy has been operating on the moon since the since the flight in November of 1969 of Apollo 12. Um, and it was the first use of electrical power system on the moon. And essentially, they have used... There was nuclear power in that? Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. That's um, crazy. And there's also, like, we shouldn't be polluting space with nuclear waste. Um, know that almost every single space mission you've ever heard of has used radioisotope thermoelectric generators which have plutonium 238 as their electricity source um and so it would probably be a combination of nuclear power um solar power and batteries and then you would essentially have a lot of redundant power systems and you could essentially set up long-term people staying on the moon it's no longer just some weird thing we're thinking about it's it is happening so just pretty crazy no that is that is amazing um my first discovery is about what we grew up on zach it's about flash games and flash animation oh the classic yes uh so homestar runner yes homestar runner um peanut butter jelly time uh the end of the world or whatever it's called i'm lit i'm lit tired i think that's uh, called the end of the world <laughs> um so the internet archive is now preserving flash games and animations uh that's the it's, it's from an article from the verge uh the internet archive is a non-profit digital library known for the wayback machine i think that josh brought a discovery about the wayback machine way back way back mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a while way, back. way back way way back uh but it's recently announced that it will now preserve flash animations and games 
ahead of Adobe's planned demise for the defunct web software at the end of this year. Oh, I didn't realize they were killing it. I mean, it's, I didn't either. It's not highly used at this point. Uh, the archive, the archive was, will emulate the content so it plays as it used to, preserving critical elements of early internet culture for browsing that can no longer run them. The Internet Archive says you can already browse over 1,000 games and animation that it saved, including classics like Peanut Butter Jelly Time and All Your Base Are Belong to Us. I had to ask Zach about that one. We've been playing Raft, and apparently that's what that code is, like those numbers. It's code for All Your Base Are Belong to Us, and I didn't know what that was from, but Zach, Zach knew That's the quite the gaming Easter egg. Yes. <laughs> But I love how they're going back and trying to save. I mean, literally, it is it, it is something that we grew up on. Like, that was oh, the yeah. thing back in the day. Flash was the early internet uh Do you ever think about what thing. the early internet was? It was so, like, different. <laughs> it's just looking at pictures, um, like YTMND, Flash videos, Flash games, and, like, instant messengers. That was like all we had to do. I remember when YouTube came out. That was a good time. There was there was video now. Yeah, I I don't think I was on YouTube early. Like I don't think I remember adopting it early. I, I remember like E Bombs World and all these, you know, Flash players. And mm -hmm. I do remember Homestar Runner. I loved Homestar Runner. I'm Homestar One O. Homestar One O. I loved him so much. Uh, and yeah. Uh, I, I I do miss miss some of those amazing flash videos because and I'm glad my, they will uh, forever be encapsulated so that I can show my children and my grandchildren. <laughs> my Steam name is a uh, Homestar Runner reference because I made Steam when I was in like eighth grade, and so uh, <laughs> I don't think there's a way for me to change it. So it stays there, and it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous when I'm not telling everyone because I don't want people to steal my Steam. But it's a Homestar Runner reference, and it's goofy. And it's crazy because, like, literally, like, I feel like Apple is the one that killed Flash. Like, it literally did. Like, in 2010, they announced that there will be no Flash compatibility on any of Apple's stuff. And then it was like, well, okay. Well, this is pointless then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it says, in the years to follow, Adobe decided to end support for Flash on mobile. Not long after, Chrome, Edge, and Safari chose to default to HTML5 whenever possible, leaving the old standby to rot. Hmm. Um, so, uh, apparently this is the year that it will die. R.I.P. Uh, Flash. R.I.P. You were very important. So, I discovered something that is interesting and adorable. So, the title of the article is The Secret Social Lives of Giant Poisonous Rats. And these are African crested rats that look like raccoon guinea pig skunks. And they look. <laughs> that's a lot of. Uh, well, uh, that's okay, a lot I'm of a, different I'm words. Post it. <laughs> raccoon guinea pig skunks. This is another one of your uh, Dr. Moreau concoctions. Let's see. It's, I mean, look at it and tell me if you think that's a good description because that's what it looks like. I mean, you're not wrong. It looks like a guinea pig's face on a squirrel skin body, but with the stripes of a raccoon. Yep. So, the African crested rat is not particularly scary. They look adorable and fluffy, and I, I would love to pet one. Mm -hmm. But... It is one of the only, I think maybe the only mammal that sequesters poison, which means it takes it. And so what they do, and this is something that, that it, people mm. in Africa had assumed it was poisonous for a very long time. People always kind of get the idea. I'm sure somebody tried to eat one and was killed <laughs> because they have essentially a so very... They eat something that's poisonous and yes. then they hold it in their bodies? No, they, they put it on there. So it is... Oh. oh, it's the only mammal known to sequester plant toxins for chemical defense. And so they have on I them see. a type of poison that is so lethal it can kill an elephant and just a few milligrams can Wait, kill a human. What? And Dang. And so essentially they think this is a, a defense mechanism because if anything even bites it, it can kill them. 
because what they do is they eat or chew up the bark and the leaves of Acocanthera shimpiri. And it is the oh, tree. Yeah, that one. Mm-hmm. It is the tree that they use to make poison arrows. It not with like poison dart ah. frogs or anything like that, but they make poison arrows out of Africa from this tree for a very, very long time. And this rat eats this tree. Well, it doesn't eat it. It chews it up and then it nibbles on those white stripes you see on it. And then when it's afraid, it puts them up and the ends of those hairs are very specific types of hairs that are porous. And they like hold oh. on to the toxin like a sponge. What? So they're poisonous little... Oh yeah, I see like they have like a, micros- uh, a microscope picture of the hair, right? Yep. I didn't know that's what that was. And so yeah, those are those it's little... like a honeycomb. Yeah, their little hairs will hold all that poisons in there. And so apparently these are also very tough to find because they like to live in trees. So they started setting up traps because they wanted to find out more about them. A tree gerbil skunk It, it didn't work for a long time. They said they had to switch to smelly foods like fish, peanut butter, and vanilla, and that got them. Out of 30 traps, they got two animals. They got a male and a female. And that was apparently the next part of this was like, then they realized how social these little guys are. So they put the two rats together in the enclosure, and they started purring and grooming each other, which is a big surprise. Oh, since everyone awesome. we talked to thought they were solitary. And then they realized they could study this. So they took an old cow shed and they turned it into a research station. So they made all these cool little nest boxes and put trees in there and had like different stuff so that the little rats could be in there and having a good time. They put cameras all over the place and they essentially started tracking everything they were doing. And so they would hang out. Uh, There's a funny quote in here. They're they're herbivores, essentially rat-shaped little cows. (laughs) <laughs> they spend a lot of time eating, but they walk around, mate, groom, climb up the walls, sleep in the nest box. And so they're just cute little rat guys. And then they found out that they're really social animals. They, uh, they're monogamous. They have a long lifespan. They, they take care of their children or their babies for a really long time. Um, and they will essentially have like family units where they're very, very like connected. And then they make a lot of noises. They have a lot of little noises that are specific for like communication. What does it sound like, Zach? I don't know. Can I've never heard it. Can you give me an idea of what you think it sounds like? I have no clue what it sounds <laughs> like. I think it probably sounds like a a wildebeest. A w- uh, yeah, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. But <laughs> then they started, tra- they started trying to track how they would use the poison. Like, is it something that's like they always are applying poison or everything like that? Every once in a while... They would not every single time, but every single rat they like gave the the leaves and branches of this tree to did at one point do it. They chew it up, they mix it with spit, and then they lick onto their special hairs that have the like the pores in them. And so then they're just dosed with poison. Um, but they don't do it like every time. But yeah, and it was apparently like a whole myth that they were even poisonous. Or that they were using these trees hmm. to become poisonous because they didn't understand how they did it. So all of this is new information entirely. And the poison, I read a little bit about this because they used it for poison arrows. It causes you to have a heart attack. What? It, uh, it causes like heart palpitations and like you eventually will die of cardiac arrest. So they're, they're very poisonous little guys. So if they take them out of their access to poison trees can can you like give them a bath and then keep them as a pet <laughs> because in now theory, they're not poisonous anymore in theory you could <laughs> essentially give them a good wash with some dawn dish soap and they will come back not poisonous is i think the hope <laughs> yeah because they do look very cute and now i want one they do look adorable and they're self-defense pets Self-defense pets. Like, if you touch this, you're poisoned. (laughs) Um, I found... This is probably one of my favorite discoveries I found in a long time because I just think it's fascinating. Uh, And I I don't know. When I I learn of something that's a long tradition in a country or something like that that I've never heard of, just like the tomato one we talked about on uh, the PDS, I love stuff like that. 
but I heard, I learned about one in Budapest. Uh, it is. Can you guys hear Mason? I'm curious. I'm gonna write down this edit because I can hear him through my headset. Can you hear him, Zach? I heard him just barely. I don't even know. It probably picked up to some level. You might hear it on like a DAW, you know, but I don't know if it's loud. Let me just go tell him that I can hear him real quick. I'll be right back. He's going to like, Mason, shut up. I'm trying to record. Hey, Braven. All right. Twigs, that little raccoon guinea pig rat is adorable, right? He's a cute, he's a cute little guy. Raven, take a look at these poisonous rats. I know, they don't really look like a rat. It looks like a stumpy raccoon, skunk, porcupine. Alright. He was cool. He just, he didn't know that I could hear him. Oh yeah, no, I'm sure he's fine. He just he he doesn't know how loud he is. He has no inside voice. He never has. I he's really like, want to hear it per too. But yeah, no. One volume. Mason only does have one volume. I don't think he's being intentional, trying to be loud. I think no, that he not. is that's his natural state. Right. <clears throat> Let me take a drink of this. So I learned about a tradition in Budapest called, and I'm going to butcher it, but I'm going to say it with confidence, Lomtalanitas. Lomtalanitas. Uh, it is a thing that they do every spring or in early summer. And basically, throughout all of Budapest, and in each district in Hungary, they have this thing where everybody is allowed to bring all of their junk to the street. All of it. No matter what the size is, no matter what it is, you can just bring all your stuff that you want to get rid of. It's basically like, okay, you want to spring clean your house? All right, bring all your stuff to the curb. This is when we're going to come by and we're going to pick it all up. But... They tell them ahead of time so that people can put it on the curb and then it becomes this giant like rummage sale but where everything's free. And so everybody just literally puts somebody else's junk in their house instead of your junk. Exactly. But I mean there's they talk about literally people will go to this once a year, get enough stuff like they've made this their profession. And then they will literally sell this and live off of that income the rest of the year until the next one. <laughs> that is kind of awesome, actually. Um, but uh, it it is fascinating. Uh, it, it's 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 oh, a really stuff good article. Everywhere. By the way. It's it's crazy. I will say, and they they talk about um, how it does look like a uh, a post apocalyptic, uh, you know, like Mad Max scene. You know, there's just trash everywhere for a few days but it dates back decades uh is simple <laughs> i say it different every time i know i was about in, to say it's evolving <laughs> in concept but complex in societal interaction at least once a year residents of each budapest district receive notice that they can throw away unwanted objects of almost any size and material by carting them down to the sidewalks in front of their buildings before lamtalanatatas day after tons of trash pile up throughout the neighborhood over the next few days, city workers laboriously pick up the motley debris in a fleet of trucks and life goes back to normal. But during this period, when the unwanted items lie up for grabs on the street, a temporary sensation of lawless disorder reigns <laughs> as opportunistic citizens from across the city descend into La Mala Tatana's <laughs> pyramids. In search of whatever valuables they may find. So it turns into the purge for a second when they, <laughs> or Black Friday mixed with the purge. Yes. Where, uh, like, when Black Friday was actually a thing, when you would, like, wait, oh, wait, and then they'd open the doors and everybody'd run in. 
Yeah, uh, <laughs> definitely. They talk about how, like, okay, if you want to do this, be very careful that there's no one around that may have made, like, a pile of this is my keep stuff because you might get beat the crap out of <laughs> because people are going through it and making a pile of, okay, this is what I'm going to take. It don't it's it's it Oh, and sounds if you like accidentally a, take it from their pile, they're going to they're going to freak yeah. out on you. Uh I love this cuz I guess that the writers of this uh, article went on the last day of this recent one. Um it says within the first few moments after passing some square, we encountered a fellow violently chopping a piece of old furniture with a lumberjack's axe. Apparently, just to remove the metal screws and hinges holding it together. <laughs> This type of intimidating incident is anything but atypical for Lantalanetanas days. Did uh, I hear an empanada so... <laughs> in there? <laughs> yes, maybe, maybe not. But also, I thought another fascinating thing is they, they bring up the fact that it's a very, it's like a buffet for local artists because they'll go out there They'll get scrap metal, they'll get things, mm. and then they'll make art out of it. Hmm. Uh, I, there's just so many different layers to, you know, the the fascinating. Yeah, I, and I also like that, like, there's an option. This is gonna probably go to the trash, but hey, if you can use it, come take it. You know what I mean? It's like a yard sale, but not because you're not making any money off of it. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I found it fascinating, although it does look like. A mess. Uh, yeah, it sounds awesome though. It like, I'm sure it would be intense to uh, be in Hungary and try and do this, but I I would go. That sounds fun. So I discovered something that might be important to others, as it as it was to me for the vast majority of my life. I read a study that is literally a scholarly journal. So I will save you. This is gonna be paraphrased, but it will be in the show notes if you'd like to check it out. But this is a literal study that they did about procrastination. So they tried to figure out why people procrastinate. They tried to figure out what the effects of that were. And they tried to figure out ways to help you Zach's going to tell us some, about an article about how procrastinators are the smartest, most intelligent, most creative people. <laughs> no. Definitely not that. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you about the fact that procrastinators, for the most part, procrastinate not out of laziness or poor time management. It's because of the negative emotions around a task. It's uh, either like dreading doing it, having anxiety about doing it, being bored or stressed while you're doing something. That's why a lot of times school will do it. So like when uh, for me, definitely in school was the worst I've ever been. <clears throat> with procrastinating because I just, I wouldn't do it till the morning of. Um, and I think that was mostly, mostly because I was like bored slash I just didn't feel like I wanted to do it. But then there was sometimes like, if it was like a really tough class or like something that you felt like almost like defeated in, that would mm -hmm. really make it so that you would procrastinate. And so they literally look into a lot of people when they're procrastinating, it's not at all that they're lazy or don't want to do anything. It's that they are afraid of that failure or they're afraid of even the potential of failure or it's something they failed before and they don't want to do it again. So there's a lot of, it basically comes down to procrastination is like you're dealing with an emotional issue related mm -hmm. to a task. And one of the best ways to try to kind of change the, how you're viewing it is you try to figure out instead of looking at the anxiety or any of the negative emotions that come with whatever you're about to do, try to figure out the long game on it. You know, try to figure out the plus sides, the things that are going to be beneficial to you, even if it's just like a silver lining, like a little thing that can just help you see it in a different light will make it so that you're not as likely to procrastinate. Fascinating. I I do procrastinate on some things, and I think it definitely <laughs> can reflect. I think I could definitely relate to it being something that is that I'm not wanting to do. Uh, 
But I think overall I don't procrastinate all that much because I usually do the opposite. I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to do this. Let me just get the freak over with. Yeah, that's you what I've what switched I mean? to as an it. adult. You it's know? like, <laughs> let's rip the Band-Aid and then hang out. Yep, exactly. You know, when you do it, you get it over with, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. Because sometimes, at least, and I think maybe more as an adult, like you said, I think I've realized that sometimes the anxiety of – not wanting to do the thing is worse than actually doing the thing. Oh, for me, it always is. That's what ended up <laughs> switching it for me because I think this really shifted for me when I got out of school and I had to start doing like job interviews because I would always get like job interviews at like 6 p.m. or something like that. And I'm like, I went through like a whole day of like, oh, I'm just nervous and like my stomach's in knots and all that. And so I was like, I would mm. rather just do this interview at seven. So I'm barely awake and just like walk in without knowing what's mm. going to happen and then just go. Then I'm done. Then I have my whole day to recover. Yeah. So, yeah, I think just as an adult, I've shifted away from wanting to put off things. And it's like if I really don't want to do it, and a lot of times I'm just like, okay, we're just going to do that right now so I don't have to think about it anymore. Same Z's. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to the other Discovery show. Um, we do record this live every week on Twitch. Uh twitch.tv slash podcast discovery show at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you want to be part of the show and or watch it live, we'd love to have you guys come in. Uh, we, we also I like to I like to be able to sh share the links as we're talking about them specifically like for Todd's. It's it makes it a little bit more interactive and fun. Yeah, it definitely is really fun being able to uh, to get some feedback as we're as we're recording it's it's something that we had wanted to do because we thought it would be fun to listen to a show and be able to talk to them directly if if they think of something so it's been really fun to do and we hope that you'll uh stop in sometime and say hello yeah so i hope you guys have a great week and we will see you next week twigsley we are not ignoring you no, I was agreeing with you. I said that that thing, what you said, you get it over with, and that's it's the it's the right thing. It's that's the fun thing. It it's better. Not the fun thing. That's probably not the right word. What, Mason? I saw him talking now. to you during the end of that. He freaking burped really loud. I'm probably gonna have to. Find oh, you're gonna have to cut your out. part of that audio or something? Yeah, because he's standing right next to me, like bah. Give me my chair back now. <laughs> I'll give you your chair back, but you weren't supposed to be in here yet. I was going to tell you. How did? Really yeah, he did just like break in minutes. there. He's got to lock that door. You got to watch out for that. All right, everybody. We are about to switch over. My big peacock chair. And we're about to switch over because it's about to be game time. Game time! Yeah, even his burps have no inside voice. You're not wrong. Ooh, I'm going to knock that over. Those are big peacock feathers. I got to set some stuff up. Are you... I'm just trying to uh, grab everything from... I like to just put this stuff in the in the slack before I'm not thinking about it so we just have it all all the recordings you know mm -hmm. so we should have them all ready why is squish sad oh he's hungry he needs to eat he does look sad Okay. I'm going to set my stuff up real quick. So, yeah, now everybody can take a look at Kirk's blue screen of Destiny without it actually being see through. It just looks like, yeah, it is the peacock chair. See, here it is in all its glory. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna maximize this so everybody can watch the process. It's all about the process. All right, we're going to show everybody the behind-the-scenes goodness. So here he is in his chair. He's got a giant blue screen. 
that it literally just straps on there and it makes him disappear if he wears a blue shirt and I can definitely hear Mason in there now do your whisper because that's your regular voice hello all right so do you need another second to uh Oh, the lights are coming on. That's the downside of the the green Ah, screen is it has to be highly lit for it to look right. So many lights, yeah. I'm I'm getting a little bit more used to the lights. Yeah, it's not my favorite. I like to be in my pitch black when I'm playing video games. But you can't do that when you have a green screen. Yes, it is the Kirk show now. Here, I'll bring it back. I'll bring it back for a second. Said don't yell. He runs across the house. That was him whispering. (laughs) He was just whispering through the house (laughs) quietly. Oh. (laughs) Okay, everybody. We are about to switch over. Push the talk on the stream. (laughs) I don't know if you can. I don't think you can. It would probably sound so much better. Not that I've seen. But maybe. No, we need to just get you uh, like a cough button. So it's the opposite of that. You push the cough button if he's yelling in your room. I mean, I have a, a hot key for muting the stream. For that reason. Mason, shut the door! Mason, shut the door! Huh? Shut the door! Huh? Huh? So funny. <laughs> okay. Everybody, All right. Let me, uh, buckle in. Let me because in about two minutes, we're going to start this stream over. But it's going to be PDS plays, and we're going to play we're some video games together. We're going to try to make it seamless, so you don't even have to leave. It'll be right after we close. It'll be, just I'll hit, be here. yeah, just hit refresh, and you're we're going to be back. So yeah, everybody, thanks so much for checking out the stream. We appreciate it. Uh, we hope you stick around. We'll, it's seriously, as soon as this stream goes down, hit refresh, and it's going to be back. That's how we like to do it, so that it's just done. But we like to break it up so on vods and everything else, it's separated. But yeah, thanks so much for checking it out, and we'll be I will be live playing some video games in under four minutes is my Maybe my estimation. Overwatch. I think it'll be less than uh, under three minutes, under two minutes, <laughs> under one minute, fifty nine, fifty eight. No, don't I can't do the pressure. Nope, can't do 56. it. Fifty six. Mason. It sounds like you're freaking playing a drum over there. Please don't. Yeah, everybody's got to just... Everybody, you need to get in there just for this. Because you're going to get to hear Kirk and Mason being loud in the same room. You're having login issues on what? Battle.net? Oh, wait. I pressed go live. End it, end it, end it.